sing praises to the Lord this morning. Uh, we're going to sing Because He Lives, followed by How Great Thou Art.
Lord, before you, we, we come and we worship you, and part of the worship is our tithes and our offerings, and they are from you, and they are for use in your kingdom. And we thank you for that. Thank you for the joy of giving. Thank you for the opportunity to just share with others what you have given to us. And we give you all this. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Please rise as we sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. All right, you guys can go ahead and take a seat unless you are a youngin, in which case I invite you at this time to head back for the special kids lessons. And a uh, big thank you to the volunteers who helped to make that happen for everybody. We love that you guys are a part of the church family. Um, back when I worked at a coffee shop for a hot second, in between summer breaks at seminary and all that, um, my boss had asked me, you know, like, why do you want to be a pastor? <laughs> And the words came to me in a way that I wasn't really expecting. I said, you know, I want to point people to Christ in this life and prepare them for the next. And I, one thing I love about those hymns that Jordan plays and him in general is they almost always have those three stages. It's not just about how we're feeling now. It's about the turning point and coming to Christ. It's about the journey we're on with him. And it's about the forever after that when the world is set right the way that it's supposed to. And the good news of Jesus that we celebrate, that we reflect on together, speaks to all three of those things. So I just hope that's an encouragement for you guys if you're facing um, death in your families, if you're facing really hard things, to remember that the good news of Jesus is not just about today or tomorrow our jobs. It's about the next life as well that we're prepared for. So I hope that's an encouragement for you. But speaking of... Um, seminaries and Bible colleges and all that, um, while normal college students at the start of their 20s were out like sampling the different alcohols that they could now have or, you know, um, competing for the state uh, championships in their senior year or, I don't know, being normal, uh, I was out uh, purchasing old comic books from the 90s and compilations for fun and for sermon illustration material. And yeah, uh, ridiculous as that is, comics have some pretty fascinating stuff that, that gets you thinking, let me tell you. For example, did you know there's this entire superhero, here's my compilation, uh, named The Spectre. And, and his shtick is that he is, quote, a spirit of vengeance charged by heaven to confront evil and deliver God's wrath. And I'm not making this up, okay? I'm sure that sounds like some sort of cranky televangelist who came up with some cringy, low-budget alternative to Spider-Man, but it's actually pretty interesting. Uh, like, th these are secular comic book writers who are using the stories of the Spectre to try to write their own views on, on justice and mercy and, and the difference between vengeance and retaliation and stuff like that. But what I think is one of the most interesting things about the Spectre comics, can you tell why it was not voted most popular in the superlatives? Uh, what I think is most interesting about the Spectre comics 
is this thing that he does where he actually goes inside of the world of a person's like soul and has some of the most important battles and dialogues there instead of just, you know, crimes up, bank robbers are all over the place, so Wonder Woman goes and saves the day. Um, so, for example, right, because I'm getting the vibe you guys don't really like comics. There's this one scene, and uh, there's, this, there's this, it's like when the story's start now, and there's this elderly gentleman named Snipe laying on a hospital bed. And you think, like, oh, okay, he's a sick patient. All right. But then a few pages later, the specter comes and, like, evaporates into the guy. And all of a sudden, the specter is inside of this, like, massive city. But it's the city the way that Snipe remembers it. The city is a picture of the man's, like, inner world, the way he views himself as a career mobster, and the way he thinks about the world, and the soul version of Snipe becomes giant and he's like I'm the boss here and they shoot it out and then he gets a hole in his chest Snipe does and he looks down and he realizes it's like empty there's nothing inside and he you know collapses inside of himself like a black hole I'm telling you it's interesting stuff none of you are convinced that's fine but this is not a segue for some sort of community group studying comic books all right don't worry 90s cartoons are not a great foundation for your beliefs and your theology right Yet, there is something really compelling about that scenario where there are like whole worlds, whole battlefields, the most interesting ones, the most important ones, beneath the surface and what we can see in people on the outside. There is something about that that is actually closer to the truth than the surface of what we tend to look at in our 9 to 5. There is something in the Bible that God thinks is important for us to know about the difference in what we see in people versus what he sees in people. What is that difference? What is the importance of what's beneath the surface? Well, the comic books are down, all right? Let's open up the scriptures and find out. This is 1 Samuel chapter 15. You can find it on page 245 to 46 there in the Pew Bibles if you want to grab those and read along in that. 1 Samuel chapter 15. But let's pray before we dive in. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word is and your good news speaks into all the different stages of our journey, all the different things that we're thinking about and wondering about. And we just pray from your word that you would give us a clarity and a vision for how you see things, what you see in people, what you see in us, what you look at, that you would give us a, a greater focus in following you and being a witness for you to those around us. Lord, we need your help. We need you to speak into our lives today. That's why we're here. And so we just open up to you and pray that the Holy Spirit would comfort and challenge us according to your will. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so if we are not superheroes, you can evaporate into people's souls and see these acted out worlds of how we view ourselves in the universe, then like... What does any of this matter anyway? Why should I care about what's going on beneath the surface in myself and other people if it's not going to pay the bills, if it's not going to you know, make my LinkedIn profile look any better, if it's not going to solve my acne issues or my cancer problems, right? If God does not see in people what other people see, then what is the difference and why does that matter? Well, as we've been walking through the book of 1 Samuel in our Rise of Kings series, we've already seen some of the differences in what God sees in people versus what we see. Uh, as we were introduced to King Saul, the first king, we saw how we look at people's impressive successes. Right? But God looks at their response to his grace. As we looked at... Um, Saul's son, Jonathan, next. We saw how we look at people's family histories, their potential, their society, or their circumstances. God sees the courage of their own faith much more closely and more importantly. 
God does not see in people what we see in people. But that theme, that point, that difference is especially obvious in today's passage as it comes to a head in one of the most important kings in all of history, King David. This morning we are introduced to King David long before he becomes King David. And it's here in this humble beginning that the point of what God sees in people becomes spelled out for us the clearest. Our chapters for this morning may not give this new guy, David, a lot of screen time. We barely learn his name. But the author of this book is giving us some very clear signals that we are entering into David's story now. He is the one who takes center stage. We are learning what is different about David than King Saul. We are learning why a new king, a new person like David was so needed. We're learning ultimately what God saw in David that was different from what he saw in Saul. So chapter 14, let's walk through it now. The Lord tells King Saul to defeat one of their enemies, the Amalekites. Only instead of completely following God's orders, Saul keeps the Amalite king alive. I don't know why, maybe like as a trophy. And the soldiers keep the best of the loot that they can find for themselves, even though they weren't supposed to. So it says in chapter 15, verse 9, Saul and the troops spared Agag, that's the king of the Amalekites, and the best of the sheep, the goats, the cattle, the choice animals, as well as the young rams, and the best of everything else. They were not willing to destroy them, but they did destroy all the worthless and unwanted things. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel, the prophet, I regret that I made Saul king, for he has turned away from following me and has not carried out my instructions. So Samuel became angry and cried out to the Lord all night. Early in the morning, Samuel got up to confront Saul. But it was reported to Samuel, hey, Saul went to Carmel where he set up a monument for himself. And then he turned around and went down to Gilgal. When Samuel came to him, Saul said, may the Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instruction. And Samuel is like, verse 14, then what is the sound of sheep and goats and cattle that I hear? Saul answered, The troops brought them from the Amalekites and spared the best sheep, goats, and cattle in order to offer a sacrifice to the Lord your God. But the rest was destroyed. All right, so even as these verses go on, even when Saul's like, Nah, I'm not buying it, uh, Samuel's like that, Saul is not giving up his rationalization of his plan B modifications to God's directions. But listen to this important declaration of God's perspective in verse 22. Samuel said, Does the Lord take pleasure in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? Look, to obey is better than sacrifice. To pay attention is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination. Defiance is like the wickedness of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Saul answered Samuel, Okay, I have sinned. I have transgressed the Lord's command and your words. Um, Because I was afraid of the people, I obeyed them. Now, therefore, please forgive my sin. Okay, return with me so I can worship the Lord. Samuel replied to Saul, I will not return with you. Because you rejected the word of the Lord. The Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. When Samuel turned to go, Saul grabbed the corner of his robe and it tore. Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingship of Israel away from you today and has given it to your neighbor who is better than you. Furthermore, the eternal one of Israel does not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man who changes his mind. All right, so... Saul finally fesses up. He changes his tune. Okay, I've sinned, right? I, I, I was just afraid of all of them, the, the people, right? So forgive me, and let's get back to business, right? But no, the, deeper is issue, the, the issue is deeper for Samuel. The issue is deeper for God. Saul is not the kind of king that the people need. Saul is not seeing what God is seeing. 
All right, but pause right there in the middle of my super amazing and engaging sermon. I want you to imagine that someone presses pause on the normal me up front in the middle of the sermon, and I'm frozen in time and space, and then all of a sudden replacing me off to the side is a clone of me with glasses coming to deliver a little mini message from this text that may not be like the big main message, but still something good that we should think about. Mini sermon time. Notice it says in verse 11 that God regretted making Saul king. But then verse 29, Samuel clearly says, Hey, the eternal one does not change his mind, for he's not a human being that he's just going to change his mind like that. It's actually the exact same Hebrew word in both cases. So basically, God regrets Saul. And yet, God, being God, does not regret anything, right? Because he's God. He means what he says, and he knows what he's doing. It's the same exact chapter in the Bible that says both of those things at once. So what's going on here, right? Well, I think regret might not be the best way to translate what this is describing for us. Um, Naham is broad enough to mean like relenting from something or grieving something. God cares. Let me just put it like that. God cares. Do you believe that? Right? The lounging Zeus with the lightning bolts from heaven in one hand and the TV remote in the other hand is not the God of the Bible. It's not the one who made us. God nahams his hand-picked Saul. He's grieved over that. He cares. He's not indifferent God is invested in people even more than we are, right? But he isn't indecisive either. He isn't like the stereotypical pushover babysitter. Saul thought, well, look, God said that I'm no longer up for re-election, right? But maybe if I can just get on Samuel's good side enough, I can change that promise. No, you don't get it, Saul. Saul. Samuel says. That's not the kind of naham that, that God was just doing. God is sorry about the situation with Saul, but he's not sorry for his choices or his actions. He never is. He's never course correcting the courses that he sets. God never makes a bad call or a bad decision or a bad judgment. God is not lost and limited as we are. Thank goodness. When he says something, he means it. Right? When he promises something, he'll do it. When he plans something, it might not look like the steps that we thought should be or the finish line and how we thought that should look, but he's never like, oh, oops, I guess we'll just go this way now. No, God does not change his mind. He's not a human being. He is God. Is that the God in your mind beneath the surface? We budge at his will. He does not budge at ours. And yet, we are moved by his compassion, which is already so much greater and more invested than our own. If only one of those two verses were true, we would be totally hopeless. But because God cares, and because he is completely competent, we can turn to him instead of just waiting for him to change his course. All right. Clone pastor unpauses, main sermon, up on stage. Pastor Andrew, the regular one, returns to stay on course with the bigger point of 1 Samuel 15 to 16. Saul is a military success, guys. He is the king that the people wanted, but he misses what it is that God is actually looking at. Saul tried to convince himself, he tried to convince Pastor Samuel that he was checking all of the right boxes. He tried listing all of the loopholes, all of the excuses that he could, but he completely ignored what it was that God was looking at. And so God permanently took Saul off of the true north of Israel's king on the compass and pointed the compass somewhere else, somewhere so unexpected that even Samuel almost missed it. Chapter 16. The Lord said to Samuel, How long are you going to mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. 
I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem because I have selected a king from his sons. Samuel asked, how can I go? Saul's going to hear about it and kill me. And the Lord answered, take a young cow with you and say, hey, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord and then invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will let you know what you're going to do. I'm not going to tell you now, I'll let you know. You're going to anoint for me the one that I indicate to you. Just think about that for a second. Samuel was mourning over Saul. I, I think that was good for him to be mourning over Saul, especially if the alternatives were for Samuel to get like, bitter and to hate Saul, right? Or, or, or for Samuel to uh, just whatever, you know, and drown his disappointments and distractions. I think it was good for him to mourn about what happened, but God's challenge is very pointed. How long are you going to look back at what I've called you to leave behind? How long are you going to, if only, something that I've decided is not happening? How many hours, days, years are you going to flip through the photos of you and Saul when I'm telling you to lift your head and see what I put around you, see what I am calling you into? Samuel is very human, right? He's a real person, and I think we should let God's words hit us as much as it hit him. But anyway, Samuel goes down to Bethlehem. Random. Go down to Eastville. Okay, God tells him that one son of this guy, Jesse, is going to be king. Actually, it's more pointed than that. I know I'm whipping out a lot of Hebrew on you today, but it literally says in verse 1, I am sending you to Jesse because I see in his son a king for me. God is not just saying, I've selected someone. He's saying, I see in one of those sons, a king for myself, a king in line with me. I see that in this person. So Jesse comes up and he lines all his sons up before Samuel. And it says in verse 6, When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab, the oldest, and he's like, Oh, certainly the Lord's anointed one is here before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or his stature, because I have rejected him. Humans do not see what the Lord sees, for humans see what is visible, but the Lord sees the heart. Jesse called Abinadab and presented him to Samuel. The Lord has not chosen this one either, Samuel said. And Jesse presented Shammah, but Samuel said, The Lord hasn't chosen this one either. And after Jesse presented all seven of his sons to him, Samuel told Jesse, The Lord hasn't chosen any of these. Samuel asked him, Are these all of the sons that you have? Well, they're still the youngest, he answered, but right now he's off tending the sheep. Samuel told Jesse, Send for him. We're not going to sit down to eat until he gets here. Awkward. So Jesse sends for him. And the guy has beautiful eyes, healthy, handsome appearance. Then the Lord said, anoint him, for he is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully on David. Turns out that's his name. From that day forward. And then Samuel went out. Look again at verse 7. The Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at this guy's appearance or stature. Humans do not see what the Lord sees. You thought I just made that up? That's in here. Humans do not see what the Lord sees, for humans see what is visible, but the Lord sees the heart. Think about that. If, that's, if, if this were just a matter of like visibility, it would be ridiculous. right? Because of course God sees the outer appearance of someone just as much as he sees the inner world and their heart. But no, that's not the point. This is about the difference in what God looks at. This is the difference in what he sees in people, what he cares about the most. Some have considered this to be the theme verse, the key sentence for all of First and Second Samuel combined. When we see the surface... God sees the heart. When we see someone smile and hear their nice greeting, God hears the heart behind it 
that's thinking, oh man, this person is really annoying to me, but I'm just going to smile anyway. Or the heart that says, man, I really hope this person is doing okay, and I just don't, really don't, want, I don't know what to say right now, but I want to smile and be nice to this person best I can. When we see someone walking into the church one day for the first time and hear them talk about their desire to come more often, God hears the heart behind it. The heart that thinks, I mean, I really just want to follow the Lord and find an answer to everything that I've messed up. Find forgiveness, find hope, find change. And this is honestly the only place that I can think to go to find that. Or the heart that says, finally, I'm going to get my mother-in-law off of my back and I'm going to forward her my church attendance record. Or the heart that says, man, so long as I come here in this building once a week and sit in my designated pew, I am not going to have to worry about this sense of God guilt or eternity hereafter stuff. I'm going to cross that off. When we see the surface, God sees the heart. So I think the lingering question for us is, so what? So what? We're not God, right? We're not supposed to be. Isn't that just the way that it is? He's God. He sees everything. He knows everyone. He knows everything about them perfectly, and we don't. So what's the point? Well, let me give you four of them. Brian's sermon from the um, Joseph story in Genesis really inspired me with his four points. So I wanted to come up with five points today to really one-up him and assert my place here. But I could only come up with four, so here we are. Okay. If God sees the heart when we surf- see the surface, then how does that affect us? Right? If there really are whole worlds, whole battlefields, the most important and interesting ones, beneath the surface and what we see on the outside... Even if God is the the only one who truly sees that, what difference does that make for us? Well, first off, guys, it keeps us from playing games with God and hiding. I mean, Saul thought that God just saw what he saw. Saul acted like God was looking at him the same way that everyone else was. But if you really know that there is no wall that God can't see through, no platitude or fake face or careful selection of words that God does not cut to the heart of, then man, what are we trying to hide from him, right? Like what, what fake self are we trying to project if God sees the heart? I mean, would it change how you interacted with the person sitting next to you right now if they knew every single thought, motivation, feeling, question, or daydream that entered your head since you walked in here? Nobody make eye contact, right? Like, that would be extremely, like, humbling, (laughs) wouldn't it? It would cut through all of the pretenses, all the, like, yeah, I'm doing okay, to to our hearts and the problems that are there. So then why aren't we extremely humbled whenever we're just sitting in the presence of God or knowing what he knows? It should humble us. It should cut through the checklists. It should cut to the heart. When we see the surface, God sees the heart. That keeps us from playing games. It keeps us from, from hiding from him, most of all. Second thing, another difference that makes, um, keeps us from making assumptions about other people. Right? God looks at the heart. Human beings do not. Even Samuel is like, man, look at that oldest son of Jesse. Is he a Schwarzenegger or what? Must be him. Got to be this guy. Right? He is king material, but nope. Even for the most godly man of that time period, Right, who is most closely following the Lord, he is not God. He cannot see what God can see. Now, sometimes people can take the whole, the heart is what matters in two different dangerous directions. One direction is overly positive. Well, he's got a good heart, right? He's got a good heart. You ever heard that? That person may have committed these felonies, or it might technically be true that we're all sinners, But I think deep down, they've got a good heart, and that's what matters. 
The problem is, if any of us were actually honest about how good it is inside of us, deep down, we'd know that none of us have the kind of heart that really lines up with God's to be enough on its own, right? I mean, it's weird to ask for an amen for that, but you know what I'm saying. I mean, just ask David. See what he did later on in his life. Hardly a saint. He needs a Savior just like anybody. God looks at the heart, and that means, right, that we can't assume everybody has a great heart just because of the way it looks on the outside or because we want it to be true or because they gave us a really nice birthday present two months ago, right? But that cuts both ways, too. We can't assume people have a bad motivation. We can't assume they have ill will towards us just because they didn't wave back on the street, right? Or they voted differently than us at the church quarterly meeting. We play God too often, acting like we see what's beneath the surface when God is very clear. We don't, not like he does. So we should care about a person's heart more than we care about the stuff we see on the outside. We should. We, we should judge each other's actions in the body of Christ when we see that it's crossed a line into sin and, and when that shows a heart that needs healing. But we need to be really careful about making assumptions, positive or negative, of what's going on beneath the surface. Because we see the surface, but only God sees the heart with perfect clarity. This big theme, this important verse in 1 Samuel 16 keeps us from playing games with God and hiding. It keeps us from making assumptions about people. Those are two like personal gut checks, two ways it affects your attitudes, your relationships. But there are two more differences that this makes for us that affect our growth in the good news of Jesus. If God sees the heart when we see the surface, then guys, that keeps our relationship with Christ focused in the right place. If the heart, okay, the worship factory, the command center, the emotional fountain, the will behind the brain, the soul, the inner world of the Spectre Comics mental imagery, whatever you want to frame it as, if that is what God sees in people, if that is what he cares about more than just the duty observance alone, more than public confession alone, more than the, the way we look to other people, then the heart should be the first thing the biggest thing that we offer to Christ to have him assess, change, put in line with his kingship. Do you get what I'm getting at? I mean, you, you get up in the morning or you get down to the comfy chair after the kids go to bed, you pull out your Bible, you're reading your passage for the day, you're reading and reflecting or, you know, you're doing a little studying or listening to some teaching or you're just thinking and praying and you ask, what? What is the first thing, the biggest thing God, how does this speak into my workplace situation? God, how does this direct me with a tough decision that I have to make? God, how does this answer the atheistic complaints from my third cousin that he challenged me with at the last Thanksgiving get-together? I mean, all good questions to be asking, but no, the first thing, the biggest thing is, God, how does this speak into my heart? God, how does this direct my heart? God, how does this answer the problems that are beneath the surface going on in my soul. When we see the surface, God sees the heart. And that's not just a practical guide for our relationships or our spiritual posture. It keeps our relationship with Christ focused in the right place. Last thing, if God sees the heart when we see the surface, then that helps us appreciate why Jesus is so often missed and missed so dramatically. It helps you appreciate the things that King Jesus and King David have in common, which we'll talk more about next week. It helps you understand the gospel, the good news of Jesus, because the surface of what his dismissers see in him is nothing of importance compared to the heart of of what God saw in him, the heart of what was so different about him, the perfect love and obedience to the Father that he lived that went unnoticed because we were just looking at the surface, which doesn't matter nearly as much to him. How could so many people walk right around Jesus and ignore him or miss who he was? 
how can so many people be inundated by Christian stuff today and hear the gospel but ignore Jesus or miss who he really is? You know how? Well, the same way that David wasn't even invited to the drafting party because he was out being a shepherd. Because what we see in people is not what God sees. When we see the surface, God sees the heart. Does that grow your appreciation for the good news of Jesus? Does that grow your adoration for the relationship that you have with Christ? When we see the surface, God sees the heart. That keeps us from playing games with God or hiding from Him. That keeps us from making assumptions about other people, positive or negative. It keeps our relationship with Christ focused in the right place. And that keeps our relationship with Christ grounded in who He is, even if so many others miss it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and just how amazing it is to be able to walk through these books. Lord, I pray for a lot of people who may have been intimidated by the Old Testament or turned off by the stories that these series will be a chance for them to just grow in their faith and fall in love with the whole diet of what you give us. We thank you for um, just the powerful uh, pointers to what you're like and what we need that we see even just in these two chapters today. We thank you for uh, the correction that you give us and the way we look at others, the way we talk with you, the, the way we put on the, the fake faces and walls and, 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 and hide behind them. But Lord, thank you for this reality check that you see the heart. That's what you look at. That's what you care about the most. Pray that would shape the way that we disciple our families. Pray that it would shape the way that we pray and read your word. I pray that would shape the way that people see who we are as Jesus followers. Not people who, you know, offer up those rams and, and check off those sacrifices alone, but people who from the heart follow you. I pray that would be a witness from this church that the world sees as they turn to you. Lord, we love you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as always, during the last song, it's just an open invitation. If anyone um, would like prayer and response to what you heard today in the Word and turn into Christ, uh, the deacons and I will be up front to pray with you. But let's all stand and sing in response to the good news, the happy news of what Christ has done for us and what he sees in our hearts and in Christ.
because God looks at the heart, he knew more than anybody what we needed. He knew the kind of king that we needed. Not one like Saul, not one that looks impressive, not one that just gets things done, but one who would heal what is broken from the inside and wash away the sin in us. That's why we're here and that's why we celebrate that God looks at the heart and he offers an answer to what's broken for it. And we look to him for it. So may that encourage you with your walk with Christ this week as you keep it focused on the main thing and your heart before him. And may that grow you as you go out to be a better witness for him where you are. Blessings and go in peace.